So just give me a cue when you want me to start. Okay. Okay, yeah, welcome everyone. And then uh, uh, now we go to the next talk of the day. So by Nelly Ng, who will tell us about quantum information and quantum thermody thermodynamics yeah, from Nang Technological University, Singapore. So thank you, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Obina. And uh, it's a pleasure to speak here. So I want to thank Camille for the invitation. And um, so I'm based currently in Singapore, but I just moved a couple of months ago from uh, Berlin. I finished my postdoc in Berlin just uh, earlier this year. And before I begin, maybe I just want to say something about um, speaking at the quantum thermal conference uh, hosted by South Africa, because this brings back um, fond memories. I don't know how many of you were there, but seven years ago, there was a small workshop on, on the same topic uh, in Stellenbosch, uh, South Africa. So I spent the weekend in Cape Town. Um, I, I had a lot of fun two weeks in Stellenbosch. And, um, I, and I learned a lot during this conference because I was just starting out as a PhD student in the field. And not to mention that, you know, South Africa is really beautiful. Uh, it's a pity that we cannot travel there this time around, but um, the program is still very exciting. And looking back, I also feel that uh, quantum thermal as a field has progressed very much since uh, then. And I've, uh, I'm glad to be part of the journey. So um, we have already heard several excellent talks giving very nice introductions to different aspects of quantum thermal. So I can go through you know, the first few slides pretty quickly. Um, I think it's fair to say that there are many different questions and directions in the study of quantum thermal. Um, there's the question of how the systems would relax and thermalize uh, quantum many body systems in particular. And a lot of this is uh, increasingly well understood uh, study from, from the perspective of eigenstate thermalization and looking at local observables. There is still room here, especially for strongly interacting systems which do not thermalize. Uh, we will see some examples later of, of this. Uh, more at the core, there's the goal always of deriving fundamental principles about energy or entropy transfers, uh, especially in a generic way, which holds independently regardless of uh, the specific Hamiltonians of the system, uh, as thermodynamics has always been. Uh, for example, Jeanette uh, explained yesterday the connection between uh, thermodynamics and information theoretic entropy. And then there's the interplay between uh, information and work or heat, which is um, stated by Landauer's principle and Silat engine uh, scenarios. And this, these are principles that um, all physical systems that encode information would have to obey. So observations like this will help us to identify fundamental limitations to tasks such as uh, work extraction or cooling, as opposed for quantum speed limits, these are also the goals to have fundamental bounds on how uh, states can change um, in terms of entropy or energy, uh, given the driving protocol. And then there's also the quest of building or studying quantum thermal engines that do interesting stuff. Uh, for this regime, uh, a lot of people look into how we can make use of entanglement, coherences, and how they affect certain tasks like uh, work extraction or cooling. So yesterday we also had a very nice overview talk uh, about extracting stochastic work from, from coherences. So that's an example. Now, given the variety of research questions, there are also a variety of different frameworks that are used to analyze. And I, I think it would be fair to say that these approaches have clashes, clashed with each other a lot uh, over the past few years. Perhaps maybe they, because they treat um, thermodynamic quantities uh, differently. So for example, resource theories have always talked about um, energy being extracted uh, deterministically and stored without entropy. Whereas in fluctuation theorems, we are more than happy to um, treat work as a stochastic variable, which is the outcome of projective energy measurements. Um, but I think it's also a happy thing to note that in the recent years, there have been many increasing crosstalks within the different approaches. And this is personally also something that I have um, uh, worked on and hope to continue to contribute in the future. 
So this is the outline of uh, my talk today. It's mainly divided into two parts. Uh, the first part, I will zoom in on uh, the theory part, um, which is uh, I, will zoom in, I will zoom in on the resource theoretic formulation of thermodynamics, simply because I've been working most on this aspect. Um, after going through some of the basics, I will talk about two particular features. Um, one is catalysis, uh, because you will hear more about catalysis in this conference, I think at least twice on Thursday, as far as I'm aware of. And uh, the, the second part is some recent work that I did during my postdoc in Berlin, along with uh, my colleagues there, which is to apply this to this framework to study um, thermalization of many body systems. So this, this will be the first part. And for the second part, I like to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about another collaboration we have uh, between Berlin and Vienna, um, where we uh, work towards studying and building a thermal machine, which is composed of quantum gases uh, described by quantum fields. So this is a collaboration in particular with an experimental group of Jörg Schmidt-Meyer in, in Vienna. So let's, let's begin. And I think for this conference, it's almost unnecessary, but I often found that it helps to begin with like a simple revision of what are the laws of classical thermal as found is in standard textbooks. So you have the zeroth law that tells you uh, when systems become in equilibrium with one another and that singles out the temperature. And you have the first law, which is essentially energy conservation. Uh, the second law has been formulated differently in many different ways historically. And one way uh, that people are familiar with is that if you put a system in contact with the heat bath, then the free energy decreases, for example. And the, the third law says, says that infinite resources or time is required to cool down to zero Kelvin. Or maybe in other words, um, absolute zero temperature is physically not attainable although we can get pretty close. So the first two laws are rather straightforward and they don't really change much even as we go for, we study quantum systems. Um, I would say that the second law and the third law were studied under different assumptions in the classical picture and have also seen refinements as, um, as we do in resource theories and also in fluctuation theorems. So before we go on, let me say another word about the second law because one thing that people have noticed is of course, that the second law, which is uh, the free energy, which is defined in general for non-thermal states, where here you have not the, not the thermodynamic entropy, but the Shannon entropy for non-equilibrium states. And um, this, um, this uh, non-equilibrium free energy is directly related to a particular information theoretic quantity, which is the relative entropy. This is, this is the function of pool density matrices. And uh, it's very important in quantum information theory because it relates to the error in, let's say, hypothesis testing type of scenarios. And the decrease in free, uh, free energy uh, intuitively means that the system, of course, uh, evolves closer and closer to its thermal state where it takes on the temperature of its surrounding bus. So as some of you may know, we see later that in resource theories, um, this condition is further refined for smaller quantum systems. So that gives us generalized or fine grained versions of the second law. So having the big picture of quantum thermal in mind, we introduce very quickly resource theories. So any particular resource theory would be identified by three elements, uh, three core elements. The first one is the set of allowed operations, essentially a set of maps that you are given for free. You assume that it's very easy to perform these operations. And um, the second element is a set of states which are free and you can generate and use them in arbitrary many copies. So given these two um, operations, uh, these two elements, you can think of them as stating rules of the game or they describe the limitations that an agent has. And uh, you can think about starting now from an initial state rho, which is non-free and ask ourselves, if you are only given access to free operations and states, um, is it possible to get to a target state row prime? So the third element is then the answer to this question. And it's usually phrased in terms of finding monotones. So these are functions that behave monotonically uh, always in the forward direction of the state transitions. Okay, so some monotones are necessary 
meaning that they are they are always required. They always happen for the for the forward transition, and some of them are sufficient. Namely, that if you observe this uh, decrease in the monotone, then it's sufficient to guarantee the transformation. Um, but they can be overly strong, for example. Um, the usual goal is to derive a small set of both necessary and sufficient monotones that will characterize the full resource theory. So that's usually the goal. Um, another remark to make is that in this scenario, we are often talking about what is called a um, single shot limit, which means that I have a single copy of rho and I want to, via a deterministic protocol, get to a fixed target state rho prime. This is, of course, very relevant uh, when you have um, single instances or small amounts of uh, number of states. Uh, but there are generalizations of this. For example, people look at single shot probabilistic transitions. And then here you are interested in, for example, finding the maximum probability of successfully obtaining this target state. Or in particular, people look at what is called the IID limit, uh, standing for identical and independently distributed. Um, it's also known as the asymptotic limit, which means that you start off with a large number of identical but uncorrelated states, so they're all in tensor product. You are allowed to perform global operations on them. And at the end, you want to reach a final state. Um, you want to produce the final state, which is up to some error, close to many copies of a target state. Um, and you want to do that at a particular rate, R. So, um, when yesterday Jeanette highlights the re relationship between Shannon theory and thermodynamics, here in the resource theory, we see uh, precisely a large amount of known results from Shannon theory in uh, optimal rates of coding. Um, they can be then utilized to study optimal rates in thermodynamic state transitions. So let's, let's have a, also a quick look at what um, a thermodynamic resource theory looks like. So first of all, three operations. Um, we want to explicitly account for all the energy sources and sinks in the global system. So the, the three operations are usually taken to be unitaries that commute with the global Hamiltonian, which might include many different systems. And as for the allowed free states, this is usually also without controversy, uh, namely that we take Gibbs thermal states of fixed temperature. And uh, some may um, object or clarify, since it's not clear that thermalization always occurs for any Hamiltonian, and that it's always easy to prepare, for example, a thermal state if I, if I want to pick a random Hamiltonian. Um, to this, I think there, there are two answers. And uh, one answer is that um, actually, um, for most of the cases, we don't need to really have arbitrary uh, uh, Hamiltonians here. Mm. But they will usually be state dependent. Um, you, you will have to have um, be able to take Hamiltonians, which has uh, gaps within the, within the input state, so that you can uh, do these energy transfers. Um, but the reason for using Gibbs states here is also a very nice observation, uh, because Gibbs states have a very unique property, which is Namely, that if you are looking for energy preserving unitaries as your free operations, then the set of Gibbs states are the only uh, set of states that you can allow uh, so that the resource theory becomes uh, is non trivial. So, in, in other words, if you use something which is not a Gibbs state as a free state and you are allowed to generate multiple copies or infinitely many copies of this then you trivialize the, uh, the resource theory by allowing um, all energy incoherent states to be uh, interconvertible to one another. And that's, of course, not, not interesting. So before I go on, I think it's worthwhile to stress two points, uh, which are perhaps often overlooked. Um, the first point is that um, this is, of course, only the simplest version of the thermodynamic resource theories. So variants exist to include more generic scenarios. For example, by using um, a switch, you can uh, have a scenario where the Hamiltonian of the system changes. So that kind of mimics like a driving force protocol. Um, we can also study resource theories where more conserved quantities are allowed instead of just energy. 
um, I think the community still continues to update our knowledge on this front. And also this theory has been generalized uh, for Gaussian uh, continuous variable systems as well. Um, the second point is that yesterday we heard about the classical aspects of resource theories, namely that uh, free operations don't produce coherences in, in the global energy eigenbasis. And the free, op free state, of course, are, are thermal, so they are not energy coherent as well. So nevertheless, let me complement that by stressing that resource theory still cannot be fully captured with a classical analysis. And that's because the input uh, state that we usually study have coherences, has, can have coherences. And um, also the free operations do allow for entanglement to be built up between different systems and also between system and bus. So it's, I think it's good to keep both the classical and quantum features of this, uh, the resource theory framework in, in mind. Uh, so to summarize very quickly uh, on resource theories, you have an initial arbitrary state rho. You're allowed to attach an ancilla bus, which has the specific Gibbs form. You're allowed to, of course, um, have any uh, unitary that commutes with the joint Hamiltonian. Uh, across the entire system and, and bus, and then at the, at the end, you trace out the bus. So um, the second law would then be the set of conditions that characterize the state transitions. And um, we find, for example, that the free energy is a necessary monotone, but there are, of course, more, many more such monotones, which are usually referred to as generalized free energies. Uh, what's more, the third law is, of course, uh, it is shown actually to be rigorously derived as a special consequence of one of the, the generalized second laws. So in this framework, we capture uh, the four basic laws of thermodynamics um, as an overview. Uh, let's move on to catalysis. Um, before we get to the generalized free energies, we have actually one last ingredient uh, to consider in, in a thermodynamic resource theory, which is the ability to have any extra ancilla which we call a catalyst. And the, the rule is that you can prepare this in any arbitrary state you want and use it freely in the process, as long as at the end you return it to exactly its um, original reduced state and it should be uncorrelated from the system, for example. And you can think of having a piston in a, in a heat engine that undergoes a cycle. And this is in principle a catalyst because you don't want it to, to change and you want to reuse it for future. So we, with this, we, we show that um, the generalized free energies are necessary conditions for such state transitions. They, they hold for arbitrary uh, input quantum states, even for those with, which uh, have coherences. Um, they uh, have a form like this. And notice that they can be decomposed in a very similar way that we did for the non-equilibrium non free energy. But instead of having the relative entropy here, you have a family of entropic measures called the quantum Rennie divergences. So these are of course named after, after the Hungarian mathematician, Alfred Rennie. Um, they are parameterized by a real number alpha. And uh, in the beginning, they were defined for classical distributions, but these generalizations um, are now available for quantum states. Uh, the divergence are very similar to the relative entropy, except that they uh, I say they capture different ways of distinguishing the two states, which are relevant in the single shot scenario. So whereas we know that the relative entropy from, from information theory, its operational significance only comes in, in the asymptotic ID limit. So the set of um, second laws would tell us that via the thermodynamic resource theory, the system can only evolve in a way that approaches the thermal state, but jointly constrained by all of these these quantities. Um, just two remarks. Um, for the limit where alpha goes to one, you have the um, usual relative entropy, which means that you recover um, the, the non-equilibrium free energy as, as a necessary but insufficient condition for state transitions. And that this, the fact that these uh, quantities are monotones is actually a direct consequence of having data processing um, inequalities. So although we do know that these monotones are necessary, they are insufficient to guarantee a state transition. And the full set of um, quantum second laws in this framework, of course, remains unknown. However, if we restrict ourselves to energy incoherent input states or output states, actually, 
uh, as long as one of these uh, energy incoherent to begin with, then what we see is that these generalized free energies become both necessary and sufficient. So if you check all these conditions, then one can prove the existence via this, um, that there exists a bus, there exists an energy preserving unitary and a catalyst that enables a transition, which is why these are, uh, I guess, powerful tools uh, that people have been using uh, in resource theories to study thermodynamic state transitions. So another thing in this framework, which is nice, is that we also understand in a clear way why exactly the standard free energy emerges in the classical limit. And this is um, because the generalized free energies converge to the standard free energy in a number of scenarios which are related to the micro macroscopic limit. So the first scenario is when uh, we take the IID limit and apply all these generalized free energies. And we see that uh, from a mathematical result on these entropies, which is known as the asymptotic equipartition um, theory, that all of the generalized free energies will converge as n grows to infinity back to the standard free energy. And this makes sense because um, I guess in, in classical thermodynamics, it's, we are talking about large, um, large uh, bulk systems, for example. Um, but I think there's also another interesting um, way to get this reduction. And you will probably hear more from Marcus Miller about this uh, on Thursday, is that if you require the catalyst to be exactly returned, but allows it to be correlated with the system, even after tracing out the environment. And in fact, this is what Marcus showed at some point, um, that one can always construct um, high dimensional catalysts such that the free energy again uh, matters. And this is rather special because it's, it's one of the rare instances where, I mean, not only in thermodynamics, but even in quantum information theory, where the relative entropy gives um, characterization for a single shot uh, transformation. And again, we proved this, um, Marcus proved this, uh, and it, it's based on the intuition that uh, the relative entropy is special in a way because it satisfies um, a property known as super additivity. So that's, that's the basics uh, and some, some stuff about catalysis. Um, I hope that I've painted a realistic picture about the strengths and, and limitations so far, but let me just spell it out to be safe. <laughs> I think that the resource theoretic framework does has it, uh, its limitations, just as any, any framework does. The way it's set up, it will probably, for example, be hard to tease out statements about time scales uh, from the theory. It will probably be very hard also to identify the necessary and sufficient conditions for arbitrary uh, the, for the full set, set of quantum states, uh, although we do know the conditions for, I think, qubit um, transitions. But on the other hand, um, the theory has its own strengths. It gives us bounds on fundamental limits of um, converting, interconverting between states, and it has been used, for example, to um, design interesting protocols for, um, or efficient protocols for algorithmic cooling, uh, state preparations. And uh, it also captures the power of correlations and catalysis in, in a pretty natural way. So um, there's give and take. And uh, I think this is why also that I believe that building bridges between the different theoretical approaches is, is quite important for us to, to gain a more complete understanding of, of quantum thermal. And uh, motivated by this, when, when I was in Berlin, several of us came together to look at how a catalyst can be useful when incorporated into fluctuation theorems. So in particular, we look at the typical um, two-point measurement scenario, which, uh, which the Jajinsky equality is usually phrased in. So this is formulated, for example, um, uh, in a scenario where the system, so you have a system here starting out in, in a Gibbs state, and it undergoes a particular driving protocol but be just before and after that, um, it's measured projectively in the energy and then work, uh, stochastic work is then defined as the difference of the, of the energy. So Jajinsky equality um, tells us that the expectation value of e to the power of beta w should be equal to uh, this quantity, which is a function of uh, the difference in equilibrium free energies. So if the Hamiltonian doesn't change, then this is just one. 
And um, one thing to note is that Jajinsky implies that the second law has to be satisfied on average, but of course it is much more stringent than that. Um, <clears throat> so in our work, what we find is that if we allow for a catalyst to be correlated with the system in this process, then we are given the capability to even bypass uh, fluctuation theorems, uh, even if, uh, and, and that is simply because um, due to the correlations that can be built up between the system and the catalyst. So um, this itself is not maybe the most surprising thing, but the more, most surprising thing that we find is that we are then, um, although we do still need to satisfy the second law on average, but with a catalyst in the fluctuation theorem setting, we are actually given the power to perform large amounts of work extraction from a heat bus, but with non-vanishing probability. So this is something uh, still I, I find still a bit mysterious about this work. And um, so I think there's, there's still more to be, to be studied in, uh, in this aspect. But, but I think that it was uh, cool to be able to take um, catalysis, which had never been studied in, in the other approaches before and try to look at what happens when we use it in, in fluctuation theorems. So, um, um, just, yeah? yes, um, just a, a question, maybe if it will help, uh, yeah, the person to understand the mm -hmm. what next. Uh, Alam, I uh, say, could you please explain what a uh, unital channel? Ah, sorry, so I skipped that part. I think unital channels are basically all channels that preserve the maximally mixed. Okay. So, for example, all unitary channels would be unital. But um, basically, a unital channels is a superset of all unitary channels. Okay, that's nice. Okay. Thank you. So um, let's come to a, a recent work on many body physics, where we have uh, applied resource theories to study um, thermalization for these systems. So this is a problem that concerns equilibration. And we mentioned um, early on that people have studied the question of why most systems look as if they equilibrate, even in the context of uh, isolated many body systems. So um, condensing the very long story, and um, what we understand is that even if you have a global state that is evolving unitarily, one can still understand ergodicity uh, in the context of looking at uh, a limited amount of observables, especially when your observables are, are local. So many results on equilibration have been formulated by identifying conditions on the many, many body Hamiltonian to say when does ergodicity hold. And the nice thing is that these results are quite generic, so they hold for a large class of Hamiltonians. But on the other hand, there's a particular class uh, of many body localized systems because um, although the systems are, can be strongly interacting, um, we don't actually meet these ergodicity conditions anymore. And uh, the systems, the local systems would equilibrate, but they would not thermalize. And the generic recipe for constructing such Hamiltonians is to start off with, of course, uh, a, a Hamiltonian, which uh, is it's relatively easier uh, in the sense that it, it can be interacting, but it is translation invariant. And then as we um, crank up a local disorder term, uh, let's say local potentials, um, which, uh, which say model impurities, then what happens is that certain local observables become more and more uh, localized and they are conserved approximately, and uh, they, pre they prevent the system from thermalizing. So let's look at a specific example where you have the Heisenberg chain, uh, where, you where you have, for example, periodic boundary conditions. And this is the, the Heisenberg type of interaction. And this um, is a disorder term. <clears throat> so this is a, the, a strength, uh, the disorder strength. And um, here you have local potentials, which are visualized by these, these random um, uh, potentials on each side. And um, so, um, So um, how do we study thermalization for such systems? You usually um, take uh, initial state at random, and then you look at the time infinite average state across the entire system. 
And um, um, what we see is that increasing this delta parameter gives a phase transition where if when it is smaller than the critical value, then a local reduced uh, region would look as if it was close to thermal. Um, whereas if I, uh, if I have delta being large enough, then we will start to see uh, MBL behavior where the local system is um, non-thermal. So theory-wise, there um, are many nice things to say about the level structure uh, qualitative difference between the ergodic phase and the MBL phase. For example, the um, statistics of the energy gaps look completely different. The, the entanglement, which is between the, the region and the chain also is qualitatively different. Um, but we use resource theories to, to study a particular problem of interest in this field, which is how robust many body localized systems are when they interact with um, an external bus. And this question is kind of important because it tells us how stable the MBL phenomenon is under two aspects. So the first aspect is, um, well, naturally no system is fully isolated in, in practice. So the question is how extensive MBL can survive in the net. Um, but even on the theoretical level, uh, if, if you have a long chain, then there might be at some points, since these potentials are drawn in random, uh, that you encounter a small region of the chain where these, all these random pot potentials are quite small and, and the system looks uh, agotic. And if these small regions within the chain are also uh, enough to destroy MBL, then people, some people express the doubt that maybe MBL is something that um, is only prevalent in, in finite size systems and you will never see this in, in large scale or, or bulk materials. So, so this is a question which has been highly debated and there, there are seemingly even conflicting statements in the, in the literature. But maybe one main problem is mostly uh, the approaches towards this problem are also um, heavily numerical. So um, we use resource theories to, to tackle this because we know that um, this, is, um, uh, this, will, this will be a different approach to, to, this, to this problem of thermalization in MBL. And um, we show that this translates uh, to a generic class of, so we, uh, we talked about resource theories before, and this is essentially a framework that, that captures the limits of how uh, systems would interact weakly with a generic bus. No? So uh, this translates into like a generic class of thermalization processes, which are modeled uh, basically by collisions between the, the MBL region and the external environment. Then we then look at uh, the minimum dimension of, uh, of the bus, which is the external bus, which is required, so that the entire system can be brought uh, epsilon close to a thermal state. So this is the quantity that of interest here, n epsilon, and this is like the this is related to the minimum dimension of the bus required in order to thermalize the MPL uh, reduced region. So here we do have to make some additional uh, assumptions on the bus Hamiltonian, uh, namely that it has an identical Hamiltonian to the region that we want to summarize. Uh, of course, a much more generic bus would have been nice, but I think then the problem becomes rather intractable. Uh, nevertheless, the nice thing about this bus model is that we do have uh, realistic experimental setups that tell us that this is a reasonable um, bus to consider. Uh, for MBL systems in the, in, for example, in optical lattices. So another point uh, to make is that this approach really gives us a handle on upper and lower bounding um, the bus side, whereas most other side. So in this paper, we present uh, two results. Uh, the first one is a sufficiency condition, uh, which would give an upper bound to the minimum required bus size. Um, we identify a map that allows us to thermalize with a particular number of copies and um, to maybe skip the information, to, to avoid information overload, um, I will skip the specific map. But I think in, in particular, uh, if we look at this bound, then we realize that it depends on one of the generalized free energies. Uh, here alpha is infinity, so this is actually a particular generalized um, free energy that we've seen earlier. And the second bound con constitutes 
um, a lower bound on the bus size, which means that you do really need this minimum amount of bus copies in order to summarize. And this is derived under terms and conditions. Uh, it is derived by identifying conditions on the Hamiltonian such that the map we saw in result one becomes optimal. So I'm skipping the details of this condition, but um, it gives us, um, long story short, a window into understanding what are the um, quantitative aspects of the MBL Hamiltonian, which makes it robust against external dissipation. So note that this um, lower bound is also dependent on d max, uh, d infinity in an exponential way, so that when um, the condition is satisfied, then we have a quasi-optimal solution to uh, the minimum bus size required. And uh, the short conclusion to this is that uh, uh, if, if this condition is satisfied, then the MBL chain is actually pretty ro robust and it requires a relatively large bus in order to, to summarize this. And of course, um, I think this is just a first step into studying the robustness problem. Um, I think there remains a lot of improvements that we can do in this direction. Uh, but I, I'd say that we were, we were pretty happy to see resource theories applied appropriately to a many body physics problem. And in the process, we could also utilize some, some technical tools which were originally developed for uh, quantum communication, actually. And we will be able to then translate that into the study of normalization. So I think I have maybe 15 minutes more for the next section um, where I, want, I wanted to switch gears and tell you uh, a bit more about the recent work that we have on, on quantum field thermal machines. Uh, this is done in collaboration with a large team in Berlin, in Vienna and Lisbon, uh, where we study the potential of using a quantum gas, which is trapped in a one dimensional system uh, in order to build a thermal machine. So for, for me, I think this was challenging and, and interesting in many ways. Uh, the first thing is, that strikes me was that, you know, um, for someone who worked in uh, theoretical quantum thermal, we study work extraction quite a bit. And um, when we started out with this pro process, uh, work extraction was reflected upon as, um, I would say, a less interesting task because there wasn't any obvious reason why we want to create a quantum gas that stores uh, pure energy in a particular way. <laughs> Maybe people who work on quantum batteries will, will disagree with me. Um, but also there wasn't um, a way to, for example, do projective measurements on uh, energy measurements on quantum gases um, because it's a complicated many body system. And um, stochastic work is maybe not the of immediate relevance. So that's that's something that first strikes. And on the other hand, uh, if you talk about cooling down quantum gas, then people get very excited because um, cooling is definitely very important for these gases to use them as quantum simulators. But then the current limits on uh, evaporative cooling are very hard to break because you lose atoms as you, as you do evaporative cooling. So the question is that, can we, can we have um, a quantum gas? Can we split it up into different components? and say, run a fridge at the level of these condensates so that effectively I cool down the system. So the idea is of course, extremely simple. Um, you've seen such diagrams since, I don't know, 18th century, um, but uh, the feasibility of this on quantum gases is quite non-trivial and that's the point. So although this, and although this is a pretty legit uh, quantum thermal machine, I would say, um, it's not very easy to approach it with any of the generic uh, theoretical frameworks that we have currently. So today I just want to quickly lay out uh, the different aspects of the proposed machine. There's the system specs, which is um, including the model for, for the dynamics. Um, there's the quantities of interest, how we are simulating them and how we can probe them in the experiment. And then uh, I give a brief description for two uh, basic operations, which are useful for a thermal machine at that level. And uh, we look at some of the main accompanying feature. Okay. So um, let's start with the system specs because we have in mind a particular uh, setup, which is built by uh, York Schmidt-Meyer's team in Vienna. They have rubidium atoms, which are trapped uh, transversely in two directions. So you will have 
one remaining uh, longitudinal direction where the atomic cloud uh, sits on this nanowire. So for these uh, 1D systems, uh, if you go to low temperatures, then, then the dynamics of this uh, system is very well described by non-interacting uh, theory of phonons. And uh, how do you, the question is, how do you control these condensates? For example, how do you put them in heat contact and, and et cetera? So to do that, um, we have, a, the experiments have a digital mirror device where you can program um, arbitrary uh, potential landscapes for the cloud to sit on. And this is done by manipulating the laser lights and changing, changing these uh, potentials dynamically over time. So an easy ex example is shown here where you have like a box potential, and then you can ramp up a barrier in the middle, creating like a double well. Uh, this would split the quantum gas into two, or you could do the reverse process by coupling the two condensates by lowering a barrier. So um, what is the appeal of these systems? So um, it is on one hand, unlike a full slash macroscopic and classical systems, because if you were splitting or merging two uh, macroscopic thermal gases, then this has already been very efficiently described by classical thermodynamics. But on the other hand, um, this is still a sufficiently complicated many body systems. It has a large number of degrees of freedom and it's not very easily tractable. But you do have some interesting physics here because um, for example, the experimental data uh, suggest that in for low enough temp temperatures and for certain parameter regimes, this, the system follows um, the sine Gordon theory, uh, which is actually a non-Gaussian non uh, interacting theory, which is hard to analyze uh, in a theoretical way. So the system can actually act like a quantum simulator to study this, this interacting model. So there are also a handful of nice effects that people have uh, observed in this system. Uh, for example, that due to the presence of uh, other quant conserved quantities, which you can generate, uh, you can observe equilibration uh, to a non-thermal state. Um, and also because you can create these well-isolated uh, quantum many-body systems, um, they don't thermalize at the global level, so you can see recurrences. Um, namely, even though you have a few, few thousand atoms and it looks like a, a thermal gas, roughly speaking, uh, you can see observables that look like they are going in and out of equilibrium. So um, these are some of the defining features of thermodynamics in, in such a many body coherent quantum system. Um, let's see how much time do I have? So I think I might need to skip some of the um, system specifics because this was initially a slide uh, intending to bring us through the, the theory um, of the effective model. Um, but I think um, a short story short, uh, long story short, is that uh, you usually have um, the Lipling linear uh, fully exact Hamiltonian, which describes uh, how what the, the Hamiltonian that the, that the atomic cloud feels. And uh, for low energy approximations, um, we, we, we do an approximation of this because the full model is of course hard to, hard to analyze. And the uh, approximation is uh, usually assuming that the density fluctuations uh, in atomic number is small compared to the average uh, density uh, number of the, of the atomic profile. So if you do uh, this particular um, approximation, then one can actually um, rewrite this Hamiltonian um, into um, something that looks like a, um, a quadratic model. It's actually, a, I mean, it, it is a quadratic model. And you have here uh, the density fluctuations and the phase fluctuations of the, of the system. And these are bosonic uh, operators. So they, they satisfy the bosonic commutation relations. And um, the energy con contributions come from density fluctuations of the system and also the spatial derivative of the, of the phase fluctuations. So uh, one can diagonalize the Hamiltonian, you can look at the discrete spectrum and the, the eigenmode representations. These are usually um, useful to understand the, the dynamics that we have. Uh, but more, more, more importantly, uh, in the simulations, we deal with a space discretized version of this uh, latinge liquid Hamiltonian. Uh, and that introduces a natural energy cutoff um, in the analysis. So, um, since we were talking about the quadratic Hamiltonian, we know that the thermal states of the system um, is Gaussian, 
which means that if you prepare everything starting from thermal states, and if you evolve the entire system with uh, such um, quadratic Hamiltonians, then your system is fully described by covariance matrix of um, density and phase um, variables. So for thermal machines in particular, we would be interested in the energetic quantities. We want to look at uh, energy. We want to look at the spatial distribution of energy. Uh, we want to be able to access entropy and relative entropies because that gives us um, correlations and maybe also entropy productions. Um, these are going to be uh, straightforward functions of the covariance matrix, in, in particular their symplectic eigenvalues. And uh, perhaps it's also worth mentioning here that the formulas for general quantum Renyi entropies have also been derived for these uh, Gaussian states. So we are in a good position to then study uh, single shot quantities if we do have access to the, to the covariance matrix. Now, of course, in the simulations, we can simulate everything and do what we want, right? But will we have access to the covariance matrix um, as uh, observables of the experiment? And this is non-trivial, of course, because um, for many body setups like this, um, one usually sets up the system to measure uh, only a, an, a restricted number of observable, observables. So for example, you can set up the imaging to uh, look at density uh, fluctuations, uh, but then you lose the information on the face, or you can do it vice versa. So it's, it's hard to actually be able to access the entire covariance matrix with, with one uh, experimental setup. Um, so how, does one, uh, how, how can one do that? So a partial answer to this is that um, you, this will still be doable if you are willing to assert knowledge about the underlying dynamics to be the, governed by the Luttinger liquid, uh, which I find that the experimentalists are glad to do. <laughs> because if your dynamics is given by the Luttinger liquid, then um, we are able to then uh, prepare the systems identically. And you, what, what happens is that you measure the density operators, but at different time snapshots. And that allows you to access the other parts of the covariance matrix uh, in the initial time. So one can do this if, as long as you stay within the time scales where you know that the Luttinger liquid is a good approximation. And this was rigorously shown in uh, Glusa et al, um, which is my colleague in Berlin. And essentially this is how one can do Gaussian state tomography on this entire many body system, which is otherwise gonna be quite hard. So that's uh, the brief picture of um, what this looks like. I think in the interest of time, I will also uh, speed up even more. <laughs> and so we have uh, five minutes. Yeah, I before. have five minutes? Yeah, before questions, time. Okay, so I'm, I'm at the uh, last part of the, the, the three uh, elements of this machine, which is to talk about uh, what are the operations that we want to perform, right? So if we think about the fridge, then there are two obviously crucial things we should do. We should be able to put systems in heat contact. Uh, you, you want to have energy transport and then you want to split them afterwards. So this is like modeling a valve uh, between gases. And then the second one is of course, you want to be able to input and output work. Uh, for example, as you see in the compression of a, of a piston. So these are, again, almost trivial for classical ideal gases, but um, for quantum gases, this will be a completely different story. So um, the explicit modeling of uh, opening a valve between two uh, quantum gases is, uh, of course, a dynamical process, which is um, hard to treat in a full flash way. But we can treat this first in the most ideal case with the, with the Luttinger liquid, and we see what we get. Right? So, we take the decoupled Hamiltonian and we take the joint Hamiltonian and then we merge them just with a linear ramp. It's, it's that simple. And we, we, we assume that the atomic density profile is static. So the atoms don't jump around uh, frantically. Um, and um, so here, here um, if you want to do the splitting con, con, uh, splitting uh, operation, then it's just a linear ramp, but in the backward direction. So uh, one can simulate this pro process. And um, <clears throat> here I'm plotting the atomic density of the two condensates that we put into contact. So this is the contact point. And on the left here, I'm plotting the spatial energy density over 
different time snapshots as we merge the systems. So um, what we see is that even when we are studying the most ideal case where the atoms don't fly around, um, excitations are always going to be injected at the at the interface. Um, so that's that's usually not what we want because we don't. I mean, we want to cool, so we obviously don't want to put too much more energy excitations into the system. Um, there is still some good news uh, because of the approximately linear dispersion relation of the of the system is that when we put in the energy at the interface, this uh, form wave packets that travels um, in a ballistic way through the system, and then they get reflected at the edge. So why is this good news? Because, I mean, if the wave packets don't spread too much spatially, then they get reflected, and then we can, uh, when they, we can time them such that when they come back, we can take the energy out again uh, when we decouple. So for reasonably short time scales, uh, let's say on, on the order of 100 milliseconds, this is how the energy contribution from the, from the phonons look like. Uh, so um, I think lesson one from, for the quantum uh, thermal abstract person, which is myself, um, that I learned from this scenario was that even the simplest thing that one thinks about, which is putting quantum gases into heat contact, um, <clears throat> they unavoidably, unavoidably would inject uh, a lot of energy. And before that, I mean, I, I only needed to care that there exists a particular energy that uh, channel that pre performs heat transfer. And I think now I know better and, and we have to optimize this process further. And it's something that um, the team has to continue to work on. So um, the second operation is the compression and decompression of the piston. And this part is simpler uh, in a sense that uh, what we can derive is that when we compress or decompress the, uh, the piston, what happens is that the Hamiltonian uh, gets changed by a factor of lambda here, where lambda is basically the ratio between the, the difference in length for the condensate. And if we look at how lambda enters uh, the Hamiltonian, we see that uh, it contributes to the uh, phase fluctuations and density fluctuations in a very asymmetrical way. So what happens here is actually that the modes, the eigen modes get uh, squeezed and energy is uh, injected into uh, the, the piston as well. So uh, we are modeling this process in a, in a quasi-static way. Uh, in the real implementation, one should do this faster because you want to stay within time scales where you don't get hit by, by the nonlinear effects. So um, one would have to then uh, study this in a, in a practical way by using uh, shortcuts to adiabaticity. And um, these come from our simulations. And uh, what we see is that as we compress, the energy density increases more or less uniformly. So that, that looks like good news. Um, um, the, the system still looks thermal if you look at the energy distributions, but it has higher temperature. Um, but actually, because of the squeezing of eigen modes, our system is um, going out of equilibrium. So it, it becomes non-thermal, and this is captured because we can calculate also the, the relative entropy uh, with respect to the closest thermal state. Um, so uh, you can think about this really as now increasing the free energy of the, of the piston, uh, put, uh, kicking it into a, in a, into a non-equilibrium state. Um, and uh, if I compress it, increase the relative entropy, and then decrease it with the, with the decompression protocol, then it goes back to zero. And that makes sense because everything we model here is a, is a large unitary. But after the compression, if we now connect this with the system or the heat bus, and then information might be dis then dissipated into the different systems. But then the question is then, can we utilize further this amount of information, um, this non-equilibriumness of the, of the piston? And we don't know yet. And I think this is another another uh, direction to go. So um, we can concatenate these operations and then we have a fridge. Uh, we can simulate this. Uh, in fact, we can simulate consecutive cycles of this, uh, of this fridge. Um, and um, so we, and, and I think, so, so of course this is, uh, in this uh, plot, what you see is three different cooling cycles consecutively. And it saturates more or less after three plots um, uh, at the 10% of cooling. 
And uh, of course, be wary about these numbers because of course they are not optimal. Um, the scheduling and the compression ratios and many other parameters go into um, having such a, such, a, such a protocol. And it's good that it's non-optimal because otherwise the numbers would be very disappointing. <laughs> but um, what we see in this, in this um, preliminary first work, first step, is that we learned uh, about qualitative features about this cooling cycle of quantum gas. And um, we learn uh, what happens in the effective model. And the first thing that we learned is that whenever we try to open up a, vial, uh, a valve and try to uh, induce heat transfer, then energy is always injected into the system. And this, this makes cooling very inefficient. So if we want the machine to perform well, the most crucial thing that we should be doing is to try to decrease the amount of excitations or at least find a way to take them out um, in the future. Um, and the second point that we see in this simulation is that um, you note that our bus is actually another quantum, an, a, another part of the quantum gas. So it is also a finite size condensate and it is non, non Markovian. And this is currently detrimental for us because the excitations that are created that, that travel into the bus, they get reflected and then they come back as uh, the piston is trying to dump further in energy into the bus. But this might not need to be the case. So we have to find clever ways to, to go about this. So that's, uh, that's more or less like a preliminary study. Um, finally, conclusions. Um, I, I found it hard to make a conclusion slide, to be honest, given that I switched gears and talked about several different things. But maybe if I take more like a bird's eye view, then the first half of the talk was about some theoretical aspects of quantum thermal, in particular resource theories. Um, I, I liked it because of um, it's a beautiful and generic setup that is that is involved and the fact that also it probes uh, fundamental limits. And the nice thing is also that there are many parallels in quantum information theory that allows us to make then rigorous statements about, about state transitions in, in the nanoscale region. One thing that always left me a bit dissatisfied was its um, disconnection from concrete systems, and which is why we studied MBL systems with this. Um, uh, well, uh, the second half uh, was a very practical and particular thermal machine, and that is quite the opposite. So things can get pretty messy. You have a lots of um, non-ideal excitations, and it's it's hard to analyze the whole thing theoretically. Uh, we have a pretty system-specific description of what is going on. But once we get past this change of mindset, then I find that this investigation has allowed me to learn um, rich rich many body physics on, on a very concrete platform, which was very fruitful. Um, I think it would be interesting to, to assess how far um, this such a machine would operate away from the funda fundamental limits that we see in, in uh, quantum thermal and what are the steps we need to make the gap smaller. So um, lastly, I just moved to Singapore and I'm starting to build my group there. So I'm looking for people who are interested to work on aspects of, of quantum thermal. So if that's you, feel free to, to write. And uh, lastly, have a great conference. I hope everyone stays safe. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Nelly, yeah, for the wonderful your presentation and going into the resource theory framework of uh, thermal, quantum thermodynamics and then application to the MBL. So we already have a yeah, couple of uh, questions. So, yeah, first, uh, Rup yeah, Rupini asked, yeah, we were in the slide when you are discussing a uh, uh, Yashinsky in inequality, mm -hmm. yeah, the definition of uh, work in resource theory, whether the population of the states have a role to play. Um, so. I am not super sure what does what does Ropini mean by uh, population of the states, but here we are actually not in a resource theoretic scenario, because um, as you see, we are here in the two point measurement scenario, which is standard for fluctuation theorems. Uh, in particular, what you do is that you prepare um, the initial state, which is um, a thermal state. You measure uh, you measure in projectively in the energy eigenbasis you have the driving protocol, and then you measure again um, 
in energy. And then this uh, gives you a um, stochastic work variable defined. Um, so this is, this is not, I would say it, it is not a conventional way of defining work in the resource theories, but it is very standard for uh, studies of fluctuation theorems. Does that make sense? That's okay. That's makes sense for me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So uh, then the next question uh, was um, when you are talking uh, on the MBL. Yeah. So the. So, yeah, I kind of rushed through that part. So uh, this relates to what is bus size, right? Yes. <laughs> so and, uh, yes. That nearby. Yes. Bath so um, of course. Uh, if you think about bus size, you think about the first thing you think about is maybe dimension of the of the bus. So here, what we have is actually because um, I mentioned that we have further restrictions on what what the bus um, Hamiltonian looks like. In particular, we are taking the bus to be um, to the bus Hamiltonian to be basically n copies of the system Hamiltonian. Does that make sense? And, and uh, n, so n epsilon here would be the amount of bus copies where the, where the um, one copy basically has the same Hamiltonian as uh, the reduced state on, on a region. So for example, if I look at this chain and if my goal is to thermalize these two lattice sites, then uh, you have a Hamiltonian on this um, reduced region and my bus is basically n copies of um, okay, the Hamiltonian on such a region. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, that's the question. Do any other person have any other question? So uh, yeah, I can ask a bit on the implementation yeah, the, of the cooling. So when you say about this change, yeah, parameter lambda in time. So that's mm -hmm. the, when you mm -hmm. try to apply yeah, to this um, yeah, cooling cycle. So how fast yeah, you can change this? Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, how, First, do you, do, you, do you have like a limit where you drive this, then maybe in a short time, and then yeah, uh, so, start to see some either. Yeah, so so this is this is definitely uh, this is very relevant because the the speed where you drive this compression and decompression will definitely change um, the state that you obtain on the on the condensate. And here for the for the simulations that we show here, uh, what we did was a very and extremely slow uh, compression, where we 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 uh, take many trotter steps and basically it, at each step we kind of compress only by a small amount, and uh, we assume that basically the the eigen modes stay uh, more or less the same in this in this process. So it's it's like a quasi static type of of process, and uh, if you want to actually model um, how the quantum gas reacts to a moving boundary that has a, a non-zero velocity, then this, this is going to be much more complicated and that there is a lot of literature actually uh, describing such uh, dynamics of these quantum gases. Now, um, there are, uh, Jörg at some point uh, mentioned to us before that there is the possibility of uh, doing this process in a, in a short way by having like a uh, quadratic trap and just closing the trap very quickly with a quench. And uh, that makes use of some, some results on uh, shortcuts to adiabaticity. Uh, but those are not studied yet in, in the current stage of, of this work. Okay, thank you. Uh, so in absence of... Uh... Yeah, I, I have just... One small comment, I mean, uh, or okay. question maybe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, since you, you, you're speaking of that, so in, in the previous uh, system, I mean, so you, you, you talked at some stage of uh, <clears throat> realizing uh, thermal matching mm -hmm. gas, 
and I was just wondering, because um, experimentally, I guess for most system is quite easy to 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 implement. I mean, to have a thermal bath uh, because naturally, unfortunately, uh, most quantum. I mean, most system have as as. I mean, sorry, are in contact with the with the bath. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do a thermal matching, you will need two baths at two different temperatures. And then mm -hmm. experimentally, it can start to be very complicated to do that. So I was just wondering if you already have some ideas how you would implement that in, in that setup, how you would realize two uh, thermal baths at two different temperatures. Mm. Um, this is not the most easy thing to do in, uh, in a setup of quantum gases, because usually what happens is that you load uh, the atoms on the, on the trap. And um, so uh, let me quickly go to maybe one of the slides. So usually what happens is that you start off with a, with a single condensate and somehow you load the, the atoms into this trap, and then you can then split this condensate into different parts. And then uh, you, you have a finite size bath here, and then you have a piston, you have a system that you want to cool. And of course, you could maybe already load them in different, different uh, boxes uh, so that they start off all uncorrelated. That might be possible. But usually, the main thing that makes this very different from the, from the usual thermal bath is that um, they are pretty small. So this system is maybe a couple of uh, 100, 200 micrometers. Um, and I think uh, if we think about um, just looking at uh, cooling performance, then I've said that the, these are actually non-Markovian effects that are detrimental to cooling. But then if you think about it another way, it's also a great platform to uh, let us study what are uh, relevant non-Markovian type of processes that that actually appear in, in these experiments are, and are very re relevant, not only for a particular setup, but for any kind of um, maybe quantum gas setup where you have a, a part of the condensate acting as a finite bus. The finite bus are usually maybe not so often studied. Um, I think this platform kind of gives you a, a way to, to study those questions, which, which is interesting in, in its own way, I suppose. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's very courageous from your part to, as, as a theoretist, to be, to start being involved in, <laughs> in a theory, in an experiment, sorry. <laughs> yeah, because as a theoretist, it's not, uh, usually it's not easy. <laughs> yes. No, but it was fun. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's always a uh, fun to, yeah. <laughs> to discuss with experimentally. Uh, yeah, then we have uh, another question uh, from Gonzalo Manzano. So he was uh, talking regarding the Yasinski inequality. The interaction with the catalysts does not render the reduced dynamics of the system non unitar Yes, so if you look at the, um, so this this relates back to, uh, let me just go back to the slide on Yajinsky. Um, <clears throat> so we, we've said that um, all unital channels will definitely obey uh, this Yajinsky equality, at least for the case where uh, the, the Hamiltonian doesn't change. This is definitely proven. And since the catalyst um, allows you to violate Jajinsky, then it means that the channel that acts on the system is definitely not going to be unital. But um, what one should uh, uh, take note of here is that um, there are actually only two elements involved in this in this channel, which means that you have a, you have a catalyst which is returned exactly back to its original state. So nothing, nothing fishy about that. It's returned to its original state. And you have a unitary, which is unital, 
that goes across system and catalyst. So it's like an extension uh, of a unitary channel, but with a catalyst that stays um, locally the same, uh, but correlations are then allowed to build up between system and catalyst. So that's that's the scenario. And because it can violate Yarzinski, of course it's not it's not unitary, but it is only a very simple extension from a unitary channel. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all. And uh, I will say on these notes, then we'll I'll thank uh, Nelly for the wonderful presentation. And then uh, any other further question, yeah, you can easily, yeah, probably email.